Shelly, I just have to say, it's such an honor for me to be here with you today. I loved this book so much. And I was telling you this before we got on our formal interview. It's your your voice in the book is such an unusual combination of being formidable and kind at the same time. So I don't know if that was something that you thought about as you were figuring out your writing voice or if it just came naturally to you. I actually, um, since I'm not an, uh, I'm not a writer, you know, I'm typically before this, it's yeah, short form. I do blogs, et cetera. So I never thought about a writing style. <laughs> I just wrote like I speak. <laughs> well, uh, the people who work with you are lucky and uh, your listeners today will be too. And I want to jump right in because our time is somewhat limited. Um, there's so many life lessons in this book, and I want to go through your life lessons. There was one that to me was kind of a through line through your life story and through the book as you told that story. And that is the idea of making choices and not sacrifices. And one of the great stories that you told to illustrate that was the story of, of your mom who was uh, making all kinds of trade-offs, but somehow managed to buy a thoroughbred horse. So maybe you can tell us that story and that life lesson. Definitely. So yes, I, I believe in making choices versus sacrifices because I feel sacrifices are some is something that you do completely for someone else. And choices are more powerful because you own them. You're doing it for you. I mean, also for other people, but ultimately for you and therefore you own it and you keep your power. So, you know, growing up, my, my mother really embodied this message because her whole view was decide what you want and go after that. But you have to make choices in order to get it. So, you know, the example I like to share is my mother worked harder than anyone else in our family, including my dad, and she never worked outside the home. She made homemade meals. She made all of our clothes. And there were four of us, right, growing up. So she was at the sewing machine every single night. Um, and all of these things. And I remember having a conversation with my mother um, because I'm sitting there cleaning up the kitchen. That's my job that night. Clean up the kitchen and I'm cleaning up the pie dish. And mom would make a homemade dessert. We had homemade dessert every night. We called it goodies. Um, and I was reflecting on the fact that, you know, we cut the pie and then everybody takes a piece. So mom, of course, gets the last piece, which is always the smallest. And I'm like, man, if this is what being a mom is all about, I said, I'm not doing it. You know, and I walked in and I basically told her, I said, mom, I'm not having kids. And she's like, why? I said, because I'm not willing to have the last piece of pie after doing all the work. Um, and she sat me down and she said, Shelly, I don't care about that pie. Right? So it doesn't matter that it's a small piece. I don't care about it. The key in life is to decide what you care about and then to make choices that allow you to get what you care about. Well, everybody lived on a budget in my family. My dad got paid twice a month and my mom on the payday, she gave us each envelopes, including my dad. And that was our allowance. And that's what we had to spend for two weeks. So everything was tightly controlled. We had to pay her 10 cents every time she drove us somewhere, just so we understood the value of time. I mean, everything was trade-offs, choices, et cetera. Well, a few years pass and my mother buys a horse, a horse. I mean, we keep our thermostat at 68 degrees in the wintertime. That doesn't mean it can't be below, but it definitely can't be above. And whenever you complained about it being cold, she'd say, well, do you want to go to college? Right? Do you, everything was a trade-off. It's like trade-off, trade-off, but she got a horse. So while everybody was doing all these things, she was making the trade-offs and the choices, sewing our clothes, right? Making all homemade meals, the whole bit, so she could save her dollars and ultimately buy what she cared about, which was a horse. So yes, that lesson is one that I've carried all the way through. You can have anything that you want, as long as you're willing to make the hard trade-offs and choices to get it. And then once you made those hard choices and trade-offs, you were an extreme planner. And when I say extreme, I am using that word carefully because, um, you know, I was reading that. And I was thinking, OK, you know, that's a good idea of planning. And then I got to the story of you being a 19 year old. I think you were 19 at the time. And you had a choice of which winter coat you were going to buy. <laughs> and you chose the one that wasn't so much in style at the time. But why did you choose it, Shelley? Can you tell us? 
Definitely. So here I am. And I just told you the family I grew up in, everything, you know, dollars are precious. And so, okay, I need a winter coat. Fine. Go to the outlet to buy a winter coat. I try them all on and I buy this one. It's kind of a got double breasted and then it's a swing coat. Well, the style at the time was kind of a tailored button pea coat, right? So I come back and I've got this coat on and I said to my roommate, what do you think? Right? And she goes, well, Shelly, it's nice, but it's not very stylish. And I said, I know, but I wanted a coat that I could wear when I'm pregnant. And she's like, what? And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, Shelly, you don't even have a steady boyfriend. What are you talking about? Right? And I was like, well, I know, but I would like to be married younger versus older because I'd like to have kids younger versus older. And so that's part of my plan. And therefore, I'm trying to make decisions now that are consistent with that. I mean, how long should a good winter coat last? You know, six, seven years? Well, in six, seven years, I hope to be pregnant and having babies. <laughs> just like, you are just crazy. Who does that, right? Who does that? Well, I wore that coat when I was pregnant. <laughs> so, you know, I, I find that by making a plan, you know, a lot of people set goals, Susan, and some people create plans. But very few people make decisions every single day consistent with their plan. I assumed that my plan was going to happen. And then I made decisions based upon that. So it all made sense to me. But the other thing it did was it kept reinforcing my plan, my goals, what I was trying to do with every single decision. It really just reinforced, reinforced and strengthened. And it also, frankly, improved the odds that it would happen. So yeah, I've done that throughout my whole life. And you also did something else. It was like you had the plan. Um... But it wasn't only between you and you. You reached out for help when you needed help. Um, and that was something that you did at the Wharton School um, when you were trying to figure out, like, how do I study on a college level here? Um, and it was something that you did when you wanted to advance in your career and you felt that, um, that IBM, the company where you were working at the time, wasn't getting you to the position that you wanted to be as fast as you wanted to get there. Um, and, and I'd love for you to talk about that, that, that asking for help. Yes. You know, a lot of people see asking for help as a weakness. And I will tell you, asking for help is a strength. Nobody, nobody achieves anything of significance all by themselves. There's not a person. And if they tell you they did, they're lying to you, right? It doesn't happen. Yeah. And so I learned fortunately early the value of actually asking people for help and getting advice. Because frankly, anything you're trying to do, someone has probably done it before. And therefore, why start at ground zero from scratch? Go learn from them and start on first base instead of home plate. So yes, I did that throughout. Whether it was in college, going to talk to professors after I struggled mightily, especially in accounting um, <laughs> on one of the overall exams. But here's the upside to asking for help is you then get people who will now support you. So one of the things that I learned is by asking for help and then taking advice and letting people know I actually took their advice, advice and appreciated their help, they then became like supporters and they became vested in my right goals and my dreams and my hopes and my, all those things. So there's a huge benefit to actually asking for help. Um, you know, I remember, um, Back, I've done it all the way through, but when I was at IBM, in terms of asking people, right, what they do and learning from them, uh, I was working a summer job when I was right getting before I was getting ready to go to college, and I was substituting for secretaries at the time. Well, the manager who was managing me said to me, "Oh, Shelley, what do you want to do?" I said, "Well, I'm going to Wharton, and I want to be a CEO." <laughs> She said, okay, right? You're ambitious. She said, well, while you're here, you should talk to people, right? About what they do. And I was like, oh, that's a great idea. So literally I would call people up looking at the directory, senior vice president of operations. What do they do, right? Um, but here's what happened. I go ask them what they did, talk to them. Well, one of them ended up helping me get a part-time job at IBM when I was at Wharton, right? So if you ask for help, ask people for things and you generally take their advice, a lot of times they'll become long-term supporters. You know, and it's interesting because you weren't only asking for help, you were also comfortable telling people how ambitious you are. 
Um, and this is something, you know, I, I talk often to introverts about the need to let people know what your ambitions are, because people tend to assume that if you're on the quiet side, that that's somehow correlated with less ambition. And, and it's not necessarily true, of course, there is no correlation. Um, so can you just talk to us a little bit about kind of your relationship to being ambitious? Did you ever feel that kind of cultural disapproval of, well, a woman isn't supposed to be that ambitious. There's something unseemly about it. How, how did you make peace with that? Yeah, the answer is I absolutely saw that. I mean, I was definitely been told that I'm ambitious and it wasn't necessarily meant to be a compliment. So here's what I learned. So early on, like I did in that summer, oh, I want to be a CEO, right? Well, with her, she thought that was cute, right? I'm young. That was all, it was all fine. But I actually quickly learned not to tell people that because I'd get these looks. And so I said, all right, fine. What I'll do is tell people a job a couple levels out, right, at a time versus the CEO job. So here's the path. But here's what I learned to do because I was ambitious and I absolutely wanted people to know what I aspired to. But at the same time, I, I combined that with asking for help. So I would bring into the conversation, one day I aspire to be, and again, a few levels up from where I am. Do you think I have the potential to do that? Right? I'd say, do you think I have the potential to do that? And people would say, typically say yes, right? And when they said yes, I would say, great. What steps do you think are important for me to take? What skills do you think I need? What experiences? Well, now I'm asking for help, right? So now they're giving me advice. I get a chance to take advice, give them feedback on the fact that they've actually helped and shaped me. And guess what? I've got a supporter on helping me achieve what it is that I'm achieving. And then when I achieve it, they feel great because they helped me do it. So I use the, yes, let people know what you want, but I did it in a way that was not in your face. I did it in a way that was not demanding or setting any entitlement or any of that. I did it in a way that was like, hand, I call it hands up and open, right? Here's what I'd like to do, right? Can you help me? Was basically how I did it. And then as a result, I didn't get the ambition pushback. Yeah. And you know, that, that point about it making the other person feel great, I think is so important because especially for people who are, are younger and just coming up, there's a feeling of if you're asking the other person for help, that it's taking something from them. Um, and if you're a considerate person, you don't want to take something from somebody else. And so, and, and you're making the really important point. It's not taking something from them. If you're building the relationship correctly, it's great for both sides. Now, this goal that you had from the time you were very young of becoming a CEO, and I think it happened during that fateful meeting with your guidance counselor that I would love for you to tell us about. Um, can you tell us about the meeting? And also, I'm curious to know, like, did you, I mean, many, many people come up with a goal when they're 16 or 17, but they might change their mind along the way. And you seem to have been just unwavering throughout. So can you kind of trace that path for us? So here I was, 16, you have the obligatory conversation with a guidance counselor. Do you want to go to college? You're going to trades, right? What are you doing? Well, my family, my father didn't have a college degree. And my, it's all about you go to school, you get the best grades. So you can go to a good college, so you can get a job. And that's kind of where it ended. So, okay, I said, yes, I want to go to college. And she said, well, what do you want to do after college? And I said, honestly, I don't know. I just want to make enough money where I can keep the thermostat at 72 degrees. <laughs> That's literally. Um, and so she said, well, what do you like to do? And I give her a lot of credit for this. I said, oh, clubs. I said, I'm in all the clubs. I like, you know, French club, American field service, the key club. I'm even a Girl Scout, but don't tell anybody, right? I mean, I was that kind of person. But more than being in the clubs, ultimately, I always found myself leading them. And I really enjoyed that. And she said to me, Shelly, clubs and business, are really similar. You get people together, you go after a common mission, get things done. And I said, done. I now have a goal. I love running clubs, so therefore I should love running businesses. I'm gonna go run a business. And when I looked around, those people were called CEOs. So I decided mm. right then and there, I'm gonna be a CEO. And then everything I did from that point forward was all about how do I improve my odds to become a CEO? And you, know, you asked, did you waver? I said, you know, I didn't. It was a goal I set, I told people. And so once I tell people, I'm like, well, I'm not gonna not do what I tell people I'm gonna do, so I'm gonna go do it. <laughs> well, 
Well, that's interesting that you say that because at the same time, you also made this really good point that part of really being a great adult as well as being a great CEO um, is learning how to stick to your own guns, to stick to your own principles, even when people around you, um, people who you might really love and respect are telling you that you're on the wrong path. Um, And I think this started for you with your decision to marry your husband, Scotty. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Oh, definitely. Actually, but it was before that. My grandfather okay. wanted me to be a doctor. So, I mean, so no, even going after the CEO role, right? I don't necessarily had a lot of support for that. For my parents, I did. But outside, people were always like, okay, you know, kind of thing. Um, but yes, my husband was the big one. Um, and when I say big, because you're picking someone that you want to spend the rest of your life with. And honestly, the only person in my family that was okay with it, not thrilled, but okay with it was my mother. Everyone Mm -hmm. else was literally, I mean, my grandmother was all over me. My siblings were like, oh my God, right? He's so old. Why are you marrying? My friends were just thought I'd fallen off the rock. I mean, we just, ah, no. If I had listened to the rest of the world, I never would have married him. Um, But I've always believed that nobody knows me better than I know me. And yes, I will listen to advice and I'll listen to perspective. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, I have to live with my decisions. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that he was the right man for me. I'd spent a lot of effort and time figuring that out. So I married him anyway. And we had a long-term, almost almost 35-year marriage. Yeah, I don't think there was any doubt about that. I I mean, really, I, I was reading the book and thinking, well, just everybody needs a Scotty. That's really the answer. Um, Do you have a process for what to do when you're making a difficult decision? And especially when people you know and respect and love are telling you that it's the wrong one? I mean, do you go off by yourself for a period of time to figure out what you really believe? What's your approach? Yeah, it actually starts... It actually starts before I get feedback from people. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, uh, the questions I ask myself, Susan, are, okay, what is it that I want? So that's the goal, right? Or objective. And then the next question is, what has to be true for me to achieve it? And then how do I make it true? So those are the questions. So I wanted to become CEO. I wanted long-term marriage. I wanted kids. Yeah. So what has to be true? Well, when it comes to a husband, I need a husband who has the same vision that I do. I need a husband who's going to be supportive and frankly, my cheerleader, because I have a lot of imposter syndrome issues. So I need Mm -hmm. help and support Mm -hmm. with that. I need somebody who's going to be comfortable in their skin and confident enough in themselves that it's okay with them that I might outshine them, Mm -hmm. right? Because I want to be a CEO. Um, So I need, I had this whole list of things that I need. I need somebody who can cook and clean because I'm not going to be the only one doing those things. I needed somebody, right? I had this whole list. So I create my list and my framework. And then once I have the framework, that becomes my decision criteria. Now I make my decision. I get input for sure. If it changes something on the list, I change it. But then I make my decision. And then when people come back and say, oh, no, I wouldn't do that. I just go back to my framework and say, do I still believe all these things? Mm-hmm. And if I still believe all these things and they all fit with what I'm getting ready to do, then I- I'm going to do it. And is it the same in the business context? Because, um, you know, I, I, w- I was really struck by the foreword to your book, which was written by Ben Horowitz. And he describes you um, going to take the the role as CEO of Zaplet, which at the time was a really struggling company. Um, and he talks about how he advised you not to do it. And he was worried afterwards that you would think he was saying that you couldn't do it as opposed to that you shouldn't do it. And I'm curious, did you take his advice that way? And and how did it, how did all that work with your framework of making your own decisions? Yeah. So um, Ben wasn't the only one telling me not to do it. (laughs) So, but yes, I, I took it more as he didn't think I could do it. So his worry was correct. So, yep. So he was right. Mm -hmm. Um, and mainly because based upon my experience, you know, throughout my career, I think that was most people when they were telling me something, that was what they were thinking. Um, and therefore, right. It's a bias or a call it a blind spot on my side that I always felt, okay, you just think I can't. 
Um, so yes, that's, that's definitely, definitely true. But yes, that same framework I use personally and professionally, you know, Susan, here's the, I'll call it, here's the, here's my secret. If you read the book, you see it. The book is all about professional and personal. Why is it about both? Because I'm one person. So the same process, the same strategies, the same approaches I use in personal life, I use in business. And in business, I use in personal. I, I don't have this thing where I take off one hat and put on another and I'm suddenly a different person. So yes. Uh, and as anything, I find that to be a strength too. Because you know what? People ask me, Shelly, what's the best experience you had to help you become a good CEO? And I tell them being a mom. <laughs> It's all about getting people to work well together and support each other or do right. I mean, all these things. Um, so that is, that's really the backdrop. You could actually see that same attitude in your approach to what you call work-life integration as opposed to work-life balance. And, uh, and you actually talk about how you really don't like the whole concept of work-life balance. Yes, I... It's more than don't like. I hate yes. underscore exclamation point the expression work-life balance. And the reason I hate it is because what is a balance? A balance is a static structure right, with two weights on either side, and they're even at all times. I don't know about you, but my life goes up and down and up and down. And to be judged on whether I'm keeping these two weights in balance, no matter mm -hmm. what kinds of roller coaster things I'm on in life, is ridiculous. I think the whole term was created to make us all feel perpetually guilty. So no, I totally, I don't use that at all. What I do believe is that I'm one person and I take my professional priorities and I take my personal priorities and I put them together and then I prioritize ruthlessly and I get done what needs to get done. And then I decide what's not going to get done and either find somebody else to do it or literally it just doesn't get done. But I, that's the way I approach it. I, I don't know how to do this thing where, okay, over here for two hours, over here for two hours, make sure. No, I mean, that's ridiculous. Um, and I also, because time is so precious, I try to do as many things as I can at the same time so that I get the advantage of integration. You know, I, exercise is important to me. And I do a lot of walks and talks, both in the office and work colleagues, as well as home, personal, and friends, because that way I get to exercise and get the meetings done, right? Mm -hmm. um, I go out to events. I used to, Scotty and I would go out to ballets and shows and things when we could and invite 30 friends I know, because I know. we're going to go anyway, right? So let's go with them and have fun and make an event out of it. I have to say, I read that sentence like three times to make sure that I was reading it correctly. <laughs> when you said that you always have at least 20 people when you would go out, because I, I, I don't know if I've ever done that once, um, but you're probably much ballet. more of an extrovert. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, you're right. My Lions Ballet events, we typically have about 50, but I thought that would be a ridiculous number for me to put down. People would not believe it. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so funny. <laughs> I think you said 20, right? In the I book? did. I did. I yeah. picked a small, I can't, I, don't remember, I can't remember if I said 20 or 30, but I picked a smaller number that I thought people were like, oh, okay. I thought if I put 50, they're not going to believe me. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to you. That's a small number. <laughs> so funny. Um, Okay, you talked also about how your experience growing up as a minority was your secret weapon um, in business. And one example you gave that I really loved was when you uh, went to Japan for IBM and you were the first person ever to make a big presentation and have it translated 100% into Japanese. Can you talk about that experience? Certainly. So... Here I am at IBM and I'm getting ready to go to Japan, move my family, the whole bit. I'm in my mid thirties and my boss at the time came from um, Australia and he's giving me my send off speech, I think. And he says, Shelly, there are three things that are important in business when you go over to Asia. And I said, okay, great. He said, tell me, right? And he says, all right, number one is wisdom. He said, that's age, gray hair. You don't have it. Okay. Number two. Number two is being male. Don't have that either. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, I'm zero for two and I haven't even started yet. Um, he said, the third is intelligence. So you better figure out how to maximize it. <laughs> that 
was my go off and be successful speech. Um, so I'm like, okay, fine. But here's what I didn't realize. And I know he didn't realize either. I've been a minority my entire life in the US. And so therefore I have learned how to operate as a minority. I know that when I walk in the room, people are gonna underestimate me. I know they're gonna think that I'm there for reasons other than just my capabilities, right? I know there's all these things, there's stereotypes, there are all these things that people think. And so therefore, when I walk into a room, I don't assume that everything I've done comes with me. I assume that I've gotta start from scratch and prove it, right? Show it. I've also learned that the best leadership style for me is a servant leader, one in which I work to help my team be successful. And if my team's successful, then I'm successful. So I took all that when I went over to Japan. Well, I get over there and I do the things that I typically do, which is, all right, got to meet the team, got to make a good impression, then I've got to figure out how I help and support them. So yes, when I did my first presentation with the Japanese team, although the senior leaders speak um, English very well, the rank and file, it's, you know, it's not necessarily because I don't use it all the time. And I wanted them to understand what I was saying. So that's why I put it all in Japanese. I couldn't read a thing on my slides. <laughs> I just knew what I wanted to say and what was supposed to be on each page um, as I went through the, the presentation. But yes, it was a shock to me when I first put up my first slide and the audience goes like a, they call it almost sucking of teeth. It's kind of a, like, ooh, ooh, right? What's this? And I'm thinking, what did she put on the slide, right? Um, but it was the fact that it was all Japanese that had them so surprised. And you spent a lot of that time in your career at IBM. I mean, well, you had worked for IBM. Your, your dad worked for IBM. You worked for IBM as a kid growing up. Then the whole first, I don't know what it was, 75% of your career was at IBM. And then came the time that you decided you needed to go, even though you really loved the company. And I would love to ask you about that sense of kind of competing loyalty to the company and to yourself and what you do when you really love a place, but it's no longer serving you or those plans that you made. That was one of the hardest decisions I have ever made because mm -hmm. you're right. I mean, I felt if you cut me, I bled IBM blue. All my friends were IBMers because we moved around. I moved half a dozen times with IBM. So what's consistent? The people you're working with. And so everything was there. My husband worked for IBM, right? So his friends were, I mean, we all these IBMers. And I'm like, man, I'm going to leave? Ooh, really? It's like, oh, it felt so uncomfortable. But the way I saw it was my choice was to stay, which would have been the easiest thing in the world. Stay, probably not get CEO, but I would have been a senior executive. I would, at that point, I would have had a good career, but that wasn't my goal. That wasn't my goal. And so, yeah, I had to make the hard decision to leave to make sure that I could achieve the goal that I set out for myself. So it was heart wrenching. It really was heart wrenching. Um, but it was the right decision. And you know, what I tell people is don't do what's comfortable. If you always do what's comfortable, it means you're not learning. It's when you're uncomfortable when you put yourself in situations, right, that isn't easy, where you're facing something new, that's when you're learning. And the only way to continue to move forward in your career and have greater and greater impact and responsibility is you have to be a continual learner. So this whole discomfort, you have to lean into it because that, that's giving you the best opportunity for growth. Yeah. And in fact, you talk about how with every move during your career, you would land up at the bottom of a learning curve. That, and that, that was where you expected to be. So it seemed to me that, that was, that's a way of dealing with the discomfort itself is knowing that it's coming and, and not thinking that there's something wrong because of it. On the contrary. Absolutely right. I mean, that's one of the things you have to learn over time, which is why I'm sharing it. When I first started, I didn't necessarily understand that. <laughs> but it became very clear as I was going through that that's exactly what happens. Because if you wait until the point where you jump to a new job and that job's easy, it probably means that you stayed in the old job way too long. <laughs> mm -hmm. So was, what was it like when you made a switch to writing a book, which is something you had never done before? Um, and, 
you know, you read the book, it just feels like it really flows and like you just sat down at your computer every day and told us your life story. Um, but I know enough about writing to know that it can't really have been that easy. So what was that learning curve like? Oh, my goodness. So, OK, so first it's put together um, kind of the outline, right? What do I want to say? Because what I was really trying to do was to share, here are lessons, here's, here's advice, here's et cetera. So when I first started to do that, um, it was laying all that out, right? And I tell people, it's almost like creating a table, Susan, in that you lay out, here's what you want. If you're going to build a table, what's a table? Oh, it's the surface that'll hold something. So you can have a top, four legs, it is a table. It's not interesting, nobody's going to buy it, but it's a table. And that's kind of how it was in terms of the book. I went through and kind of created something and okay, then you go back and you try to make it more interesting and then you try to add more depth, right? And then so it was, yes, and then change order around to to meet to a set of stories and then frankly, chop it up because my target was millennials. You know, I want people in their 20s and 30s um, to be able to learn from this and therefore I wanted bite-sized wanted bite-sized things so they could either skip around or take chapters. So all of that was a process. You know, you create something and then you chop it up and then you try to make sure it all links. So it was over and over and over again. I mean, it was, it was two and a half years. Um, it wasn't my full-time job, but it was, it was two and a half years of working oh, through yeah. this. I'm not surprised at all. And did you have to make the decision to be as vulnerable as you were in the book? I did. I mean, you, you really didn't uh, hold back, it felt, from telling us the times when you felt insecure, not up to things, uncomfortable, whatever it was. Yeah, that was a very conscious decision. Because here's what happens. There are so many books out there that make it sound so easy, right? I took step one, step two, oh, I had a little hurdle or obstacle, hopped over that, step three, and yeah. bing, I did it, right? Yeah. Well, the problem is people read those books, and then they live their own lives. And their own lives are hard. And then they think, gosh, I'm just not cut out for this because it's so hard for me. Well, it's hard for everybody. They just don't tell you. So I wanted to tell people, no, this is hard. There's hard trade-offs. There's ramifications. There's all kinds of things that you're going to deal with. But just because it's hard, don't stop. That doesn't mean stop. It just means mm -hmm. get more help, get more support. That was the kind of message that I was trying to, to give because there are way too many people out there that don't achieve their aspirations, not because they don't have capability, not because they're not ambitious, right? Not because they're not talented, but because they don't always realize when to get help or don't realize that everybody finds different things hard, right? Or all these things that become obstacles suddenly feel permanent. And I wanted them to know it's not permanent. There's not one thing that's permanent. There's always some way to get around, under, through, et cetera. So keep pushing. Just get more help. Have you been hearing from millennials who have read the book? I have. I have. And honestly, what are they telling you? That is the best part. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm getting everything from, whoa, I'm now reinvigorated. You know, I got a note from a, a young woman who basically said, Shelly, I find myself thinking about your book and your messages as I'm making decisions. I'm getting ready to have a conversation with my boss and I'm doing, I mean, that's, that's what I wanted to hear, right? I get notes from people that they've earmarked and highlighted and, you know, they're using it as a reference doc. I mean, oh my God, that's so, you know, that's fantastic. So I am hearing very positive feedback. And I'm also hearing from people who are like, you know what, that planning thing, it's not me, but, <laughs> but I did get other points out of it, you know, imposter syndrome and this, that, and the other. So wonderful. I'm not telling everybody you have to be just like Shelley. That's not the purpose of writing it. I was trying to say, here's a lot of what I've learned. Pick what works for you, right? To help you improve your odds. I, you know, when you said that about people um, highlighting the book and writing certain things down, it reminded me that there was one sentence in there that I thought was just an amazing life philosophy. You were just kind of writing it you know, it was just one sentence among many as you went, but it really leapt out at me as being kind of like embodying who you are and embodying a great way for anyone to live. So I'm just going to read it. You said, I don't deal in drama. I deal in accepting reality and controlling what I can. 
And I really love that. My mother used to say all the time, you can't control what people do to you and you can't control what people say to you, but you can control how you respond. And, and you can't control what life brings you also. It all fits in there. And so, you know, that's, that's absolutely how I, how I try to live my life. Absolutely. Throughout this book, you paint a really deep and loving portrait of your husband, Scotty. And I want to talk in a minute about what a cheerleader he was for you throughout um, and, and what it means to be a cheerleader in general. But but on this point about just handling what life brings you, um, Scotty was obviously like a really just shining light of a person to everybody and in particular to you. And um, it was really hard to read about him developing cancer later in his life and, and passing. And um, well, first of all, I'm so sorry. Thank you. And on this point about how you deal with your life in general, I was really struck that when this diagnosis came, you know, your reaction was, okay, we're all going to die one day. And maybe this is happening to us a little sooner than we wanted, but this is how life is. And um, I don't know, maybe you could talk about Scotty and about that process. Scotty was an amazing man. Uh, he was not perfect, but he was perfect for me. <laughs> and I will tell you that when we found out that he had cancer and it was a terminal cancer, um, it was hard. I, uh, you know, it was absolutely hard, but I've always believed I'm a spiritual person. I've always believed that everything happens um, for a reason. And somehow there is a blessing. So I had to think hard for what could this blessing possibly be. And what I decided ultimately was that I and my kids were going to live a better life as a result of living through this with my husband, because we were going to realize at a much younger ages, relatively speaking, that there's no promises and that you need to live life now. And we weren't going to put things off that we normally would put off. And literally from the point of his diagnosis, we didn't. We immediately took three weeks and went to Africa. <laughs> three weeks, went to Africa. I mean, my kids were just starting their jobs. They had no vacation. So it meant, okay, they used up all their vacation, right? To do the trip. And then we decided as a family, you know what? Every other year, they're going to give us two weeks and we're going to go somewhere special. Now, honestly, without his diagnosis, we wouldn't have done that because they wouldn't have given us all their vacation, right? I mean, there are a lot of things. We would have just waited, waited for the right time, waited for the right moment. And so what we learned through Scotty and through all that is we were going to live life first and fight cancer second. So cancer was not going to be our life. Life was going to be our life. And we just happened to be fighting cancer. And that is how we tried to approach everything. So we didn't keep it a secret that Scotty had cancer, but I'll call it through our extended networks. A lot of people didn't know he had it for a while because we never acted like he did, right? There were things that he couldn't do any longer and what have you, but we traveled, we celebrated everything. I mean, it was, it was amazing. And I kept working and I know people were probably judging me about that. Gosh, how can she keep working knowing the time is ticking and da, 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 da. But you know, when we talked about it, that was all part of living life. If I were to stop, you know, matter of fact, I'll, I'll tell you a real quick story, Susan, on the whole stopping piece, which is Scotty went through a really bad phase where I honestly didn't think he was going to make it. He had lost, he only, you know, he lost 50 pounds. He couldn't walk. Um, and he's laying there just skin and bones. Right. And I'm, and he's, I mean, doctors all the time, this all the time. I'm in, I'm a CEO. I'm trying to do these things. And then the straw that broke the camel's back was the doctor was like, he has to have only food that's cooked at homes because food in restaurants has more contaminants and he has no, I'm like, Oh my God. Right. So I mean, how are we? So anyway, I tell him, I said, babe, I think I need to step out. You know, I, I don't see how I can handle all this. And he said to me, I'll never forget it. He said, if you step out now, then that means our life is just about cancer. And then what the hell am I fighting for? So, and I get emotional right now. Um, yeah. So we were very much a team and we defined life by living 
and we worked very hard. And listen, the way we got through that period, well, how did you get through that period? Was my village. I called yeah. on help from everybody. I had family flying in. I was like, I will send to airplane tickets. You know, I had family flying in to help me. I had friends cooking for me and they're all busy and they know they have to cook at home. All right. So this is all. And everyone got us through a terrible five month period, but we got through it and he got better. And we had another four years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That moment, you you, you talk about that in the book, that moment where he says to you, we're not going to live for cancer. We're going to we're going to put that second, um, that really, really leaps out as an amazing, amazing lesson that he taught everybody. Um, and so I, I actually want to end by asking you to just talk about what it meant to have Scotty as your cheerleader through your life and what your advice is to the people reading your book about who their cheer who their cheerleaders might be. I know how important this is to you and I've seen you tweeting about it. Having him in my life and my cheerleader was critical. I don't know that I would have achieved all that I achieved without that because many times I had self-doubt. Many times I, you know, was second guessing myself and he was the one there saying, I know you can do this, right? You can do this. Um, and we all need that because as I said, life is hard. So it's so important, whether it's your husband or your friend or your mother or a sibling, everyone needs a really strong cheerleader in their lives because it's hard. So he, you know, he, he was, he was everything. You know, I told him right up until the end, knowing everything I knew, living through all the good times, hardship, tragedy, all of it, I would have married him all over again in a heartbeat. I was very, very fortunate. Yeah, you were. You are. Thank you very much, Susan. Thank you so much, Shelley. Thank you for sharing so much of yourself with us in this interview and in this beautiful book. I appreciate it.